if you just do it, it'll turn out okay. Hey everyone, we're back. We're talking time with caffeine. We have two of my today. We're gonna to talk about the mushrooms invaded. No skin. <laughs> Face of the mushrooms. But anyway, now we're, we're, we're talking about fungi. Because I figured a few weeks ago we talked about our cousins, the plant. Why not why not talk about our closer cousins, the fungus? Yep. But it for, is odd. Yeah. But let's but you probably, if you don't know these people by now, you, you should. But most of you probably do. But introduce yourselves anyways, from top to bottom. Who's on top? That'd be you. Oh, <laughs> all right. I am Jackson. I run a YouTube channel titled Jackson Wheat. Uh, you can search me on YouTube or Google or Twitter, whatever. Um, and I discuss topics in evolutionary biology and zoology predominantly occasionally i'll do creationist debunks as i did this past week on uh, prophet of zod's channel um so go check that out or check me out or do both hi <laughs> oh hey rj uh i'm brian i run the brain bug youtube channel we mostly talk about uh some, same, some kind of the same kind of stuff Jackson does, except with a little less uh, authority and a little more insects. <laughs> no, I just yeah, I know Brain. Jackson he was my first, Brain was my first guest on uh, a a guest hosted thing on the new platform on the laptop. So we are aware of one another. Yeah. Nice. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, go ahead and introduce yourself, RJ. <laughs> that's uh, that's what Lamont was uh, was wanting us to do. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, I'm R.J. Downard, uh, old fart who has been making life as miserable as possible for creationists now for uh, some 30 years and doing it a bit more professionally now with uh, Jackson writing books <laughs> and uh, such like, debating and uh, genuinely doing stuff. Sorry, I was a tad late. A friend of mine had dropped off a bunch of uh, empty filing cabinets that he had scavenged, and I was arranging them, cramming them down into the basement for the endless maw of sourcing. But anyway, let's get on to the fun guy. Uh, yeah, you missed, missed the joke before, but yeah, I made a picture. Uh, I had a picture up here of the future of our, the possible future of fungus evolution. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> There's fungus among us. Hmm. You guys are a fun guy. <laughs> but well, as I mentioned to Jackson some time earlier, to my knowledge, I think fungi are practically extinction proof. They are one organism that doesn't seem to suffer much from that sort of thing. They're even more resilient than insects. So that's saying something for them. You'd have to take away all the nutrients and <laughs> from the uh, from the biome to wipe out fungus. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Uh, yeah. So we'll stop sharing that and let Jackson share his thing if he needs if he's sharing anything. The share. I'm sure you're all surprised to know I've made a PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> I'm shocked, shocked to hear that, Jackson. I know there's gambling in this establishment. All right, so let's. Uh, I think I just pressed the wrong button. Uh, share. Oop, I did press the wrong button. No, go away. Um, share our screen. Sure, we'll just do that one. Okay. Can you see it? Not yet. I can see it. What are you looking at? The evolution, evolution of fungus. And this... Okay, so the two of you can see it. RJ, can you see it? No, I'm I'm just seeing the four screens on the the thing. But don't 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 worry about me. I'll catch up. Okay. You're watching the you're watching the YouTube video, or are you watching the? I'm right here on the restream. I don't have okay. another uh, connection up. Okay, well, let me see if this will do it. Let me try to make it full screen. See if that'll. There help we you. go. Yep. Bingo. I Bingo. Bingo. Evolution uh, of fungi. It's not framed uh, anymore, but I can see it. Yeah. Is what? It's, it's, it's fine. Not I, it's it, good. It, it's good. good for me. So it's good for the. It's good. Since it's good for me, it's good for the audience. Okay. All right. All right. So as Lamont mentioned, we are talking about our closer relatives today. Well. How much more closely related are we to fungi than either of us are to plants? But first and foremost, what is a fungus? Fungi are eukaryotes. 
There's over 148,000 known species with uh, an estimated 3 million species unnamed at present. They are uh, major decomposers in their respective environments. They uh, secrete digestive enzymes onto their food. They're very similar uh, they're, they're very similar to us in a lot of ways. For instance, most of them are multicellular heterotrophs, just like we are multicellular heterotrophs. But we, but animals take their food in and then secrete digestive fluids in whatever gut they have. Uh, ex with one very bizarre example, uh, are you guys familiar with the Placozoan? Trichoplax and herons? Mm, just a bit. So I they're not... <laughs> So there's, I've, heard the, I've heard the name before, but... Okay. So, Trichoplax at herons is one of the most basally derived extant animals. Um, it It's an entire monotypic phylum. That means there's only one species in the entire phylum. So you have sponges first, probably, then tenophores, then you have Placozoa. And the Placozoan looks kind of like a little amoeba. It's very, very simple. Um, it's uh, evidently lost a lot of structures through its evolutionary history. And it, like fungi, secretes digestive enzymes into the environment and then consumes its its food, which is very weird for an animal. Very, very weird. Mm, no, and no, no sponge does that? No. Sponges um, filter water with um, little cells called coanocytes. So they basically take water in, and those little coanocytes beat their cilia back and forth, and they that's how they grab their food, and then they process it. I, I suppose the natural say... phylogeny question would be would sponges still have retained that business end of it, but don't use it, and the placozoans uh, have uh, retained it and made use of it because they dropped all the other stuff and become a derived um, system. Right. Right. Would, wouldn't a fly be considered as uh, putting its digestive fluids into the environment and then consuming it back in now the way that they eat? I mean, in part, but also they still consume it, and then they have digestive enzymes in their stomach. But these, it's like the, the Placozoan doesn't digest it internally, digests it externally, and then takes it in. Mm. Right? But I mean, so, but, flies still take it in and, and digest it further, right? Yeah, there's like a two-tier two, two tier kind of digestion process there. Right. right? Yeah. Right. So, 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 but, but in the family tree, guys, we're, 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 we're more related to the, them guys than, than we are to the sponges, right? To placozoans, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There, there's a lot of fist fights among um, phylogeneticists as to who is most basally derived, but it, from consensus, generally, that seems to be the case. Uh, sponges, then tenophores, then. Are, are the placozoans uh, primarily parasitical, or do they are they free? No. They're just free-living little ame amoeboid wow. animals. They just kind of live. There, I believe the first one was found like in, a, in an aquarium, and wow. um, and they're they, yeah, they're just kind of chilling, hanging out. <laughs> yeah, going there, go there, happy. To... Do they spore? I I don't think so. No, I don't believe so. Sponges, um, kind of, yeah, sponges will, will spore, right? And... Well, they can. Well, some can in certain um, conditions. They have the little gemules, yeah. um, but I, I'm not. I'm not super familiar with placozoan reproduction. But I don't think so. But I could be. I wrong. was wondering, wondering how many other because homo uh, homologies with fungi is it's one of the things that you like. You look at when you look at a sponge, you see a lot of not homologies. Uh, uh, well, I guess they would be homologies. Uh, well, these would be convergences. Yeah. With with uh, the placozoan because how derived it is, those would be convergences. Um, as it sort of went back to a more sort of protestan uh, existence rather than animal existence, but but at any rate, um, so they digest, they secrete digestive enzymes onto their food, then take it in. All the digestion occurs externally. Uh, fungi have they have cell walls like plants, and this is one of the things that got them categorized with plants. We're all familiar with the animal, mineral, vegetable. Yeah, that was um, about the as I was about the ask that that's probably your profession, your presentation later on if. Like, like, if we, if we knew like when or why they're like first they were plants, and then like, wait a minute, these aren't plants at all. These aren't plants at all. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I mean, at first they were thought to be plants because they're you know, they don't really move. They just kind of sit around. They look sort of like plants. I mean, you'd be forgiven for mistaking one for a plant. Um, in fact, they form root structures just like plants do. Well, not just like plants do, but I mean, they form root structures too. Um, and so 
if you just look at them from a gross morphological perspective, you could probably be forgiven for thinking it's a plant. If you, just if like you had, Will. just like what? Is it just like whales are fish and bats are birds? Well, well, not. I mean, okay. Well, to be fair, uh, people by the mid 1800s knew that whales were like a subset of artiodactyls. Um, yeah. To to say that you know whales and and bats were part of these you know majorly different groups, you have to go way way back. You have to go pretty far back. Um, but but yeah, I mean. Um, fungi were thought to be, you know, contained within the plants. In fact, um, it, if you take a course that includes fungi, it's the botany course, you know, and so yeah. because they're they're still considered taught with the plants. Uh, which it's, that's so weird because uh, like they grow they they don't the the organism itself doesn't even expose itself to the sun. That's one uh, one uh, kind of overarching for it for most funguses they they uh, avoid photons if they can and right. they're mostly live underground what well, even what what erupts through the earth is or through the corpse or whatever they're growing on is mm -hmm. uh that's just the fruit that's like a, that's right. like the it, it's it's just where what it's putting out there to spore the organism is inside it's in the dark Right. So they right, so exactly. they live down inside of stuff, hunker down, and then they poke themselves out every once in a while to do sex. Yes, basically. Although sex can also fungi. occur in the dark. <sighs> well, and those also, are only it, for the shy it, fungi. And, and also, I, I don't know if you I saw I don't know if you mentioned this in your your in your presentation later on too. You might because you know I I do that lot, I did that last time too. I I, I come up with something. It's like oh, it'll come up in a second, but. Like, don't like fungi have like three or four se different sex or something like that? We will. Well, I guess worse that, than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fungi do every like major group of fungus really has sort of a as a different spin on how to do sex, and we will talk about each of them as we go because there's like I said, actually in this very slide I say they have a variety of life histories. That is very true. <laughs> um, very. Very gracious of you to put it that way. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's um, it's a little bit of an understatement to say they have a variety of life histories, um, and we'll we'll you know discuss why um in a few slides. So yes, you are correct, Lamont. We will discuss that. <laughs> um, of course, the cell wall of of fun fungi instead of containing um uh cellulose ha contains chitin, uh, which interestingly arthropods also contain chitin, but I believe it's a different type of chitin it's a different hmm. if our so uh, it's still a convergent correct? development of the biology brain bug is that right it's like a different uh yeah of chitin, a, isn't it? It, it yeah it's 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 a different different like compound of of chitin right okay yeah i just want to make sure um so they have various symbiotic relationships with plants bacteria as well as other fungi of course we'll get to those later uh we'll talk about that more in detail and then variety of life histories so we good on this slide? Yep. All right. <clears throat> so phylogeny. So this is an overarching phylogeny of uh, eukarya, basically. So the bottom most branch we have, those are the the uh, excavata, or part of the excavata. Um, so the most ancient branching group. So the ones we're looking at are the ones which are at... So the fungi are at the top, the top pinkish purple. Um, and then our group, the metazoa, is the blue right below that. And so um, our group, our total group, is called uh, Opisthoconta. Uh, but so Uniconta is the group containing amoebozoans, uh, animals, fungi. That whole group is called Uniconta because we have one singular uh, flagellum at some stage in our development. Whereas plants and their relatives are, um, are uh, Biconta because they have two flagella at some stage in the development. And so, so first we're talking amoebozoans, um, fungi, and animals. That's the overarching group, as well as a bunch of other uh, protists, and we'll talk about them shortly. But, and so getting a little bit closer, uh, you have phylogeny of opisthoconta. That's fungi plus animals plus a few other little protozoans, things like um, this is a teratosporia, uh, which is also known as ichthyosporia, philisterians, coenoflagellates. Um, those are a bunch of different little protist groups. Uh, most people really aren't familiar with Philisterians or, or Ichthyosporians. Uh, I don't think Philisterians are parasitic. I think they're free-living. 
Uh, ichthyosporians, um, a number of them are parasitic. They prey on various fish and, and arthropods. Um, Carnoflagellates are pretty neat. Uh, they're the closest relatives, of, the closest living relatives of animals, as far as we know. And some of them do um, facultative multicellularity in the presence of certain bacteria. So that's really cool. And then, of course, the animals. But we're not interested in animals today. Animals can, can take a running leap. We're talking about fungi. The total group encompassing fungi and their closest relatives is called holomycota. And uh, so, yeah, fungi. And uh, the oldest fungus we have uh, fossils of currently is Orosfera geralde. And uh, that was from about one billion years ago. So we're talking... It, during the the boring billion, RJ, um, is when we find the earliest fungi. So part of the reason, um, or w one of the the reasons that uh, researchers think there was a big, um, there was a, an early radiation of 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 uniconts, uh, about about a billion years or so ago, is the onset of eukaryovory. So that's eukaryotes consuming other eukaryotes. They're eating each other. And so uh, this happens. This also may have spurred on the uh, the origin of animals. So fungi, a bunch of different protist groups and animals may have all been sort of spurred along by this uh, origin of eukaryovory as they're undergoing adaptations to avoid getting eaten by other protists. And so the closest relatives of fungi we see right here, you have microsporidia at the top. But we'll talk about them in a sec. They're on the next slide. And uh, so you can see the the phylogeny of, fung of fungi, funguses, <laughs> has undergone a lot of changes in recent years, as every phylogeny has, because genetics has become a major factor. It's not just about uh, morphology or embryology anymore, even though, those, of course, those are still major factors in determining phylogenetics. But now... We have, we have to consider these in addition to genetics. So we can't just take one morphological feature as the sort of end-all for a group. We have to look at other factors as well. So, for instance, uh, the chytrids, which were considered the most um, primitive, quote, groups of fungi, are all are, are, are actually form um, a paraphyletic group, and we'll talk about them shortly. And the same is true of the um, the zygomycota, which now form multiple groups. So that those four right there that form a polytomy, uh, mu mucoromycotina, uh, entomophthoromycotina, those are all, those four right there, those are all the, quote, zygomyco zygomycetes. And then glomeromycota. Those are the coolest funguses, by the way, just so you're, so everyone's clear, this group right here, are the, <laughs> those were, that's where our, uh, our brain control and stuff comes from. Yeah. Right. Some of it, yeah. Some of it's in uh, that group, and some of it's in the the really cool ones, in my opinion, are in the Eskimo seats. But of course, we we will also talk about them, and, and I'm sure you'll have a lot to say about them when we get there. <laughs> um, and of course, the Basidiomycetes are the traditional fungi that we think of, the mushrooms. That's that group, and we'll talk about why are they called why are they called Basidiomycetes? Why are they called Ascomycetes? Why are they called Zygomycetes? Well, we'll talk about all that because some some guy named them first. <laughs> Exactly, because someone uh, had a fever dream and, and came up with natural selection. That's which, what, no. uh, which phylogeny is this? The one that I, uh, I'm i aware of, one in uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences from 2017. You're, uh, if it's that one or maybe one more recent. Uh, this is current biology. I'm not, oh, I don't okay know what the do. exact paper is on it, RJ. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> current biology? Just you're, curious. You mean you're not using 23-year-old old biology? Uh, I don't think so. I think this one's... Oh, uh, no, that, one... that would be Standing for Truth. Yeah, that'd be, yeah, Standing for Truth or Kent. This Hoover paper Hoover. from 1985 says... <laughs> um, so I'm not, I'm not, um, but I was checking this one against a couple other ones, and I think this one is reasonably close. It may not be perfect, but it's reasonably close to what mm -hmm. the, the consensus is, at least from what I could see. So, yeah, memory what? serves me. I mean, it, there hasn't been any huge revolutions in the major connections. I think it mainly relates to the fiddly bits with some of the closely uncertain clades because it's yeah. all, it can't go on fossil record. It's all based on genetics. 
I right. think uh, that there's a big problem with uh, like the creationists and a lot, and a lot of people in your generation. No offense, RJ, still want to. Oh, no look offense towards, taken. Looks to look towards taxonomy, towards that sort of classification. Whereas uh, you know, as we move more towards cladistics and and uh, towards especially with, as as we map more and more genes and we move more yeah. towards that gradient direction. Of you know that we we accept that oh, any any but, creationist relying on the Dwayne Gish era 1980s creationism is up the creek because they knew practically nothing about the subject. Right. <laughs> right. Wow. Um. So the closest fungal relatives. So I thought, hey, why not? Um, fungal relatives. You have basically two groups called uh, nucleate mycea, which also go by other names like um. Christodiscoidia and a couple other ones, and Microsporidia. So, nucleate mycea contains a couple of amoeboid protists. Um, you will probably never encounter any papers <laughs> about them unless you go specifically looking for them. Is <laughs> is really all I have to say about them? Uh, Fonticula, which is that little guy on the bottom right, they just kind of eat bacteria, and that's really all they do. They're not well, the major gotta, parasites. I've got eight microsporidian papers in my uh, tip data field. <laughs> well, no, microsporidians are are important. I'm talking about the nucleate mycea. Oh, okay. the top the top group. Yeah, no, the microsporidians are are um, parasites. Um, like encephalitozoan uh, is a major hmm. parasite. Um, it, they have yeah, they have interesting uh, these little modified mitochondria. So <clears throat> there was. This uh, Thomas Cavalier Smith back in the uh, 80s, I believe, came up with this idea of a clade called Archezoa, where he thought, what if there were protists that are still alive today, uh, which possessed a nucleus but had not yet evolved mitochondria yet? Yeah. And this, was, a, of course, was wrong because they mitochondria came first. But. Yeah, there's a 2006 mm -hmm. paper on them. Uh, Microsporidian mitosomes retain elements of the general mitochondrial targeting system. So they've still got little fossil remnants knocking around yes. in their genome. They do. Yes, they have Yeah, um, these like kind of reduced mitochondria, which are mitosomes. And um, the the other group, so Archezoa was, con was composed of two groups. One was Microsporidia, and the other was uh, Metamonata. Which is now a group of excavats, uh, excavats, and they, their, um, their mitochondria are are called uh, hydrogenosomes. Now they're also highly modified. So, but both, but uh, Cavalier Smith thought that um, the archezoa, two, the two clades that make up that group, were basically sister to the rest of of um, uh all other eukaryotes because they had the mitochondria, or sorry, they had the, the nucleus, but no mitochondria. And that, of course, turned out to be wrong. Although, with a funny twist, because metamonata is part of the group, which is probably <laughs> sister to the rest of eukaryotes, although for a different reason, not because <laughs> they lack mitochondria, but because they're so genetically uh, ancient. So are um, the, so qu qu question, are these mm -hmm. two fungus what, cl uh, Clo, clo, oh, I can't remember the name. Clo, clophiliates are the sponges. Like, I'm sorry. The what? It's the, the, the thing that closest related. It's the thing that. Are these basal? Is what he's what he's asking. Are these basally, basally derived with respect yeah, to fungi? Can, can I can I close? What's that thing? Uh, clo, clophilia. It starts with a C. Choanoflagellates. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, these are sort of the coenoflagellates of the fungi. You could think of them that way. Yeah. They're... Remember when we're dealing with with trying to work out the the branchings mm -hmm. at times when all we have are their dim and distant descendants. Right. That you know we can't give like a measuring stick to say that the taxon X is at point eight from the uh, derivation, whereas another one is point seven and therefore is a little bit closer. So it, it's all right. really rule of thumbby. Yeah, right. yeah, these we have no fossil record for either Microsporidia or Nucleomycia. In fact, these guys hadn't even been placed genetically until like just a couple decades ago. So we know very little about them overall. Yeah, which which would be funky to see whether Gunter Beckley and the intelligent designers would somehow ram them into the Cambrian without 
uh, having a fossil record on there, whereas an evolutionist can use it based on the branching phylogeny. Right. Well, you hear the apologetics that they're going to base the the uh, complexity, saying that the uh, the simplest free living uh, bacteria is this complex or whatever, and that's just it, it's silly because anything that's alive now, no matter how simple or how complex, has been evolving for the same, you know, what? Uh, yeah. Where are we up to but, now? But the, the interesting thing is. But at least, even with the forms we have in their derived forms, you have such a spectrum from fungi into animals that it's mm -hmm. like a, a complicated game deciding just where you're drawing the line because there aren't abrupt differences between each one of the components. They've got a little bit of this and a little bit of that and almost that. They're all mosaics. Right. Yeah. They're um, right. Yeah. Oops. Um, Okay, let me close that. All right. So yes, we do have a lot of um there there's a huge range of different um you know of protists and uh you know in, in varying places along the phylogenetic tree of life. Um and the the it's always getting uh, changed with respect to protists because we find new groups and that changes how the old ones are related to each other and uh, it's it's just a mess and it and of course, as we continue to discover, it's going to just keep getting added to. It's going to get larger and larger and larger, and the creationist and intelligent design people are never going to contribute to it. So, you know, there's that. Um, I'm so oh, far. Right. Oh, I did also want to point out that with respect to the Archezoa thing, so Metamonata is part of Excavata, which is funny, even though it has the mitochondria, but, but there is actually, as another twist, there is an Excavate which doesn't have mitochondria. It's called monocircuminoides. So Metamonata was thought to not have mitochondria. They do, but one of their relatives doesn't, and it was discovered later. So that's the funny little bit about... Uh, yeah, and, the, and there, that actually is an interesting question about what goes on in the process of uh, parasites, for example, that will reduce their genome and right. pass off more material to their hosts whether or not there's kind of like a dividing line stage where it's relatively easy to just junk the mitochondria, which after all, with their own little DNA, are like a parasite in a parasite. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, and, I, um, and again, I know you're going to mention this in your slides again, but uh, they're like the third group besides plant animals that became multicellular eukaryotes. Uh, well, I, well, uh, well, it depends on how you. Well, oh, no, I mean there there were like twenty different groups of protists that became um, um, independently multicellular. I meant, uh, the, I meant the eukaryotes. Yeah, of the eukaryotes. Yeah, there were like twenty different groups. Um, oh, I did not know yeah, that. there's there's like uh, various groups of algae independently became multicellular because the the uh, red algae, yellow algae, brown algae. Um, uh, various several different green algae they're all independently multicellular it wasn't like one it was just they all did it and in fact um quinoflagellates are kind of operating at the boundary some of them are multicellular some are not some are can be multicellular if they need to so yeah there's i'd like you know as already said there's a huge range they cover like the entire spectrum of <laughs> multicellularity but Jackson, yeah. they're not the no true Scotsman uh, multicellularity. Only that one counts. <laughs> oh right, I forgot. <laughs> only certain, um, uh, <laughs> like only certain multicellular organisms like porridge, right? So anyway, um, are we good on this slide? Yes. This okay. porridge is too, this porridge is too hot. All right, the chytrids. So um, chytrids are a, well, I say polyphyletic, it's probably more correct to say paraphyletic, um, but chytrids were considered, uh, they're the, the quote, most primitive fungi because most of them are still um, unicellular. <clears throat> so fungi are kind of cool because the kingdom actually contains unicellular and multicellular members. Unlike, you know, plants, which are all multicellular, or animals, which are all multicellular, some fungi are unicellular and some are multicellular. And in fact, there's a really good paper, uh, I think it's Neji et al. 2018, uh, and I did not quote it here, I, I should have, but I forgot to, which talks about the origin of, of the 
uh, fungus roots, and I say that in quotes, which are called um, mycelia. Uh, rhizoids. Sorry. Oh. Um, uh, well, well, uh, mycelia are another structure, but um, the the rhizoids, um, which well, actually, actually, mycelia are another example, are another good example. Um, both of these structures are what you could call uh, simple multicellularity, and it turns out actually very few gene families needed to be expanded to go from unicellular chytrids to having um, this multicellular mm. um, hyphae or or, you know, or the mycelia or these rhizoids. Very few gene families actually needed to be expanded. So, so the idea and that just you have to, to have... show you how the uh, uh, systematics uh, was undergoing uh, the one paper I have in on, on the, on the uh, uh, chytridum uh, mycota uh, was from 2006 on uh, molecular phylogeny of the flagellated fungi, which they describe them as. Uh, mm -hmm. And a description of an entirely new phylum, a uh, blastocladiomycota. So yep. uh, the the systematics was in flux by that time. Right. Yeah. So it, and I'm I. It's constantly changing for fungi because <laughs> they're again they're they're always discovering new ones. They're just all over the place and they're doing all sorts of things. And I think uh, it's about, I, I believe it's fungi. Accelerated by the fact that you've got uh, the capacity to gene type in a way you wouldn't if people were hunting around for fungi uh, 50 years ago. Right. What were you saying, Brain Bug? I was gonna say, I believe fungi are uh, more uh, susceptible to uh, bacterial horizontal gene transfer than any other. They oh. are, in fact. And that is another thing we shall discuss more in detail. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's it's kind of how you make lichens. Well, it's, oh man, that's another oh, thing lichens. I forgot to include. God dang it. Ah, oh well. Lichens. Um, yeah, the they're... short form on lichens is that ly lichens are fungi that are in a symbiotic relationship with bacteria. Well, are they yeah. related to that? Wow. And, yeah. And it's we will discuss kingdoms. this further. It's so cool. But yeah, we'll get to it. Yeah, well, we will. I have a slide where we, we, gotta where stop we can introduce yeah, this. We got to stop spoiling Jackson's slides. <laughs> well, you guys, you guys know so much about this topic. So there you go. <laughs> Um, uh, chytrids are often parasitic, uh, Batrachochytrium. Can you identify what organism it, it parasitizes? Ooh, the track of Placozoans. Frogs. Frogs. Oh. Ding, ding. Yep. Batracho ah. is the prefix for frogs. So. Jackson, oh. tell me, Jackson, tell me he wins. He wins a free trip. To, no, sorry. We fungal can't afford infection. that here. <laughs> free fungal infections. You get a free, a free fungal infection. powder. A free trip to the Ark Encounter. Sorry, oh we're, we're actually punishing you for getting the answer right. <laughs> I would totally go to the Ark Encounter. I'm going to engage with the staff, though. I Probably feel like they would I. have you escorted out if they if you engage with Probably them. so. Um, so, yep, yep, Batrachochytrium kills frogs. And this is one of those fungi, which um, there's also one that kills bats. I don't know if it's a chytrid, though. But basically... There are places where you go and they tell you you can't come into this forest without like cleaning your clothes and things like that mm. because you could be tracking um, or, or cave systems. They're like, you have to tell us where you've been within a certain number of months because you could be tracking spores from this fungus, which could uh, hurt the, the endangered so bats or frogs. So are there. so good at sex that they can even use humans as pollinators. Yeah, that, that's the I, thing. You're always covered with with fungus spores of some yeah. kind. You're you all the time. Even, even uh, like plants, plant pollen and stuff. You don't have to worry about so much in this in the winter months. But there's fungus that that are that thrive in that in, in mm -hmm. the cooler climates, like your basement. They're uh, relentless. Yeah, I, I hope I hope I hope no OSD people are listening right now. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, if, uh, if plants don't scare the jabbers out of you, the fungi should. <laughs> right. So, uh, are we good on this one? Mm -hmm. I believe so. Okay. All right. Can you notice how the pictures of all these things look little, little, wibbly, blobby kinds of stuff? You know, that, that even though they have multicellular components and stuff, that they're so small that that's why nobody gave them much of a mind until fairly recently when they could look at them with microscopes. Right. And now we have really cool uh, things like eDNA where you can just take like a soil sample and then figure out what all the organisms are that are in it or that have been in the area, you know, recently, Ooh, which is really cool. Sex. 
Well, actually, ki most kittreds don't do sex. Uh, most kittreds are asexual, so yeah, I know, sad. Uh, but, uh, but instead, they're really good at being asexual. I mean, hey, if you don't have to, if you don't have anyone who, uh, to join in, you just you know start on your own. Uh, the only problem, of course, if, if you're familiar with the the evolution of sexual reproduction, is that leaves you open to other parasites or to environmental catastrophes. If uh, if if you are not recombining your your genes with someone else's or your alleles with someone else's, I guess, um, then you can't adapt very quickly to uh, environmental changes, and so that leaves you open to extinction, which I guess isn't necessarily a bad thing. These are parasites, but you know, sucks well, for so them. I the, guess. Are the kittens able to pull this off because they're themselves the nasty kid on the block? So any parasite that's trying to interact with it. It's going to try to do the opposite with them. It's going to try to win out on that front. So exactly. These, so these parasites, <laughs> so these parasites have to worry about parasites, their own parasites. Then they could theoretically, like, uh, well, a bacterial infection. Yeah. Um, I want yeah, to get a, oh, sorry, can I ask a question about the rhizoid. Sure. I know we talked about it on a previous slide there, but I, I just when we, we when I mentioned mycelia, and you're like, well, that's another good example. Is is a uh, the mycelia would, is is a derived rhizoid, right? It's it's the structure that like like emerged from uh so uh, mycelia are made of what are called hyphae uh mm -hmm. which uh, it, it, it may be a highly derived derived rhizoid um so the hyphae are basically like uh, the the root structures and then when you have interacting um uh, hyphae from different fungi this forms a, a huge interconnected network called the mycelium and so that's this can stretch like acres believe it or not it's crazy how big these things can be Multiple you know, if you see, species. yeah if, if you see like you know one little fungus one little mushroom coming up out of the ground well that the the mycelium from that mushroom could stretch like an acre or so so yeah it's pretty crazy yeah but yeah there's the a 2013 paper uh in ecology letters on uh, the, the title itself is a mind blower Underground signals carried through common mycelial networks warn neighboring plants of aphid attack. Yes, it's, it's yes, incredible. Yeah, um, I mean, hey, if if you are a uh, one of the one of the really interesting things that some fungi can do is they uh, can actually share nutrients between different plants, so they can actually connect one tree to another and like swap nutrients between them and genes. With, they can yeah. share, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, so some, some, in some sense, you can think of them as a superorganism in the same way that an ant colony is a superorganism. So right. you take the mycelial network and the plant's root network, and they together form the I'm going to butcher this word the hyocorsal uh, network, uh, which can span uh, the basically continent spanning uh, network. Uh, of course, humans have interfered and broke that up, but right. You know, Theoretically, Maybe. yeah, it could stretch for miles and miles and miles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool to think about, huh? <laughs> the um, the world's largest forest right now is uh, the Pando Forest, which is the, the quaking aspen, um, mm -hmm. populous tremuloides. And all the trees are connected by their roots. So could you there's imagine a, how many fungi are also part of that? There's yeah. a contender for that, uh, for that position for like the largest organism. Uh -huh. uh, it is a fungus, it, it, and I think that Pando beat it by weight, but by like acreage, mm. it was bigger. I'm not sure though. So, which That's one what, is it? Uh, let me see. I'll, I'll see if I can find it. Go on with your slides, and we'll we'll yeah. revisit. Yeah, it. yeah. I, I keep on wait. I would keep on trying to say something, but I don't know if you're gonna mention it in the slides or not. So I, I, keep, I keep holding my tongue. I'm like, so I talk about what this. You got? Or not? Well, two, two things. Like one, you mentioned the root system. You know, uh, done there, like the how. I, I read or saw the things about how the fungus actually helps plants root systems. Yes, that is correct. And yes, we will come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you guys, you guys know too much about fungi. You're jumping ahead. <laughs> All right. So the chytrids. So in the same way that that the chytrids aren't really one group, zygomycota is also not one group. This is a paraphyletic or possibly polyphyletic group of fungi and uh these guys 
our uh, so this includes several different groups um like uh these names these are definitely names which i'm not going to attempt to pronounce and so as you can see here in uh, the square square a for instance there like so, hold on let me make this larger okay so so the top the top left square in that picture is a fly being attacked by a fungus by zygomycete. How about that? Just yeah, just like our our little butt eating uh, uh, cic cicada fungi. Yes, I did the news. about that this morning, RJ. Uh, yeah, it was is that fun. Cordyceps stuff. or which one? Which one? Uh, that? Massospora cicadina. It's a. Uh, let me see. It's oh, Massaspora cicadina. Oh, I remember that one. Yeah, yeah. that's right. I, I don't know which group that's it in. Does, and it makes they, the they, they, a little randier too, so that helps spread the uh, thing with that. But yeah, can you can you think about it? Enjoying your sex so much because you have a fungus that's devouring your butt. They so, they don't even have they don't even have the organs anymore. What it does is it there's a, a cocktail of uh, psychotropic uh, uh, ephedrine, uh, visco uh, cyblin, uh I, I, I think I pronounced that right. And then uh, amphetamines. So the amphetamines, the, 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 the cycle popped up on drugs. Yeah. It's a, it, and, and they have a big uh, uh, sex orgy uh, while they're all stoned. It's, I, I, I'm yeah. surprised that some guy aren't bigger stockholders in big pharma. Well, they, so the, what they want to do is they want to make them fly up oh. and fly around so that they spore. So uh, yeah. Actually, yes, massaspore is a zygomycete. So how yeah, about that? Like on my seat. Mm -hmm. so, so Brian, do you have to deal? You ever had, had to deal with fungus in, uh, in your collection? Uh, as you, as no. You tried to make so, your no. I, I I have had uh, some uh, uh, mushrooms, and they, they're they're, they're dead by, some of my vivariums do grow a little bit of, of mycelial uh, connections and stuff, but but no parasite mushrooms. No, no parasitic disease. ones. No. Uh, Going, I'm excited. We're getting to the good stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the the uh, the name Zyga, Zygomycota comes from um, their uh, zygospores, which are uh, spherical spores, which are um, diagnostic of this group. Uh, just like chytrids, they can be sexual or asexual, though they are primarily terrestrial. They are plant, insect, and animal parasites. Fun, fun stuff. For reproduction, as you can see in the sort of the top right, that's the zygospore. That's the big um, hardy spore. And then, of course, those can hunker down for years, decades, possibly centuries until conditions are right. Then, oop, out they pop. And Which would right explain on their merry why way. they would be extinction resilient because, you know, asteroid, who cares? We'll just sit tight for a while. The, uh, yeah, yeah. the ones... The spores for the uh, the locusts that we are not locusts the uh, cicadas that we've been talking about um, they go do the, so there's phase phase one where it actually causes them to it eats their abdomen and then replaces it with a fruiting body and spreads spores while they fly around in their in their uh, their their drug orgy but uh, the second <laughs> drug phase, orgy the second <laughs> phase, yeah that's what it is I mean I mean you're not wrong <laughs> goes goes dormant uh, in the in the offspring. For 17 years. Isn't that crazy? 17 yeah. years. Just now just think about this from a design perspective. How creepy is all of that? Yeah, that is pretty whack. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we get on this one. Pretty straightforward. They yeah. oh actually here we are. Here we have the the hyphae or the the uh you have multiple so this is where we were talking about the uh, the mating types earlier. So there can actually be like hundreds of different mating types for for fungi, um, where you you have to find someone of your opposite compatible mating type, right? So they, so they only go asexual. There's no there's no other ones around, but they, if there's other types around. They go they go sexual. They can yes yeah. That, so those are different ways to deal with again. And you know this also contributes to why. Um, they're extinction proof. I mean, you can hunker down for centuries Damn. and then if you're ready to, um, to sporulate and you realize oh, there's no one around who cares, I'll do it by myself. Then, so okay. so their, their sexual mode is either Tinder or Pornhub. 
Yeah. What's, the, what's the, again like yeah, are they me think you know <laughs> like like if they did if they do die not die like 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 how many species of fungi have have, have or not have been lost in the five or six mass extinctions that we, we've had. <sighs> I mean, that's a good question. We and we'll probably never know. Yeah, um, yeah that, even... that would be the thing because of the lack of fossil record, we don't know whether they're there or not. I think the only connection is that they can they can find the inferences of them in their connections to other plants. So one of the reasons right. why we don't have coal forests in the way uh, that um, had been previous is because fungi came along that could process lignin. And, and wouldn't you know, RJ, we have a slide. Uh -huh. Oh, goodness. There's a slide, yeah, also, there's a slide for also, that. Also, if you've got a slide later on with the connection with the early plants around 450 million years ago, um, I'll wait till that slide. You know, like, uh, you know, like how they, they might have beat plants to the, to the land? Well, not merely that. There's a brand new paper in Science Magazine this week on the, the interconnection between uh, the lipids that plants produce and how necessary those are for the uh, uh, fungi. And so that's the drivers of land plant evolution. Uh, that's uh, in a brand new paper by Rich. Uh, lipid exchanges drove the evolution of mutualism during plant terrestrialization. You know, it's like that science just keeps figuring stuff out. Exactly. And wouldn't you look at that? We happen to be on that very slide. <laughs> Boing. So now we can talk. Boy, now we can talk about mycorrhizae. Um, so, plant mutualism. So, the, a mutualistic symbiotic relationship between a fungus and a plant, or multiple fungi and a plant, is called mycorrhizae. If you look at that bottom picture, so the root system that looks like a bamboo shoot, without mycorrhizae, is the one on the left, and the one with mycorrhizae, as you can see, is much larger, much thicker. Is the one on the right? Um, fungi certainly beat plants to the land, um, and, in, and they formed, uh, these symbiotic mycorrhizae with cyanobacteria first. Um, geosiphon piriformis is a fungus which still forms these sort of relationships with the cyanobacterium nostoc punctiforme. And then once the plants kind of came along later, the bryophytes and their cousins, are then, there any lichens that contain cyanobacteria? Sorry. Are there any lichens that contain cyanobacteria? Yeah, in their in their ecology. Not that I'm aware mm. of. I don't think cyanobacteria typically form um, symbiotic relationships. Mm. It's usually more just the it's the fungi who do the the, the relationship. Yeah, I, I yeah. think I think they're pretty much an exclusive property of um, the uh, a plant chloroplasts where yeah. whatever was going on way deep in the origin of plant systems, that mutualism got going as an organelle and nobody else has been able to pull it off. Right. Yeah. And so um, then once the bryophytes, once the hornworts, the mosses and the liveworts made it onto land or sort of made it onto the beaches, um, the fungi started having this relationship with them, which allowed them to colonize the land further. Um, and so the, the major group of, of fungi, which does a lot of the um, mycorrhizal associations are glomeromycota. Um, and this group includes the gigantic fungus prototaxides, which existed from the Ordovician to the Devonian. And well, it could be a glomeromycete, which is what some researchers have argued, although others have argued for an ascomycete affinity. Um, I mean, we're looking for, you know, we're looking at something which lived 400 million years ago, and we're trying to discern its its phylogeny, you know, yeah. off of parts that were probably predominantly soft. So not easy. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw this, I watched this video about, they thought that maybe fungus helped break down the rocks to let the plants grow. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, fun, fungi still do that. You know, they will get under or in like the foundation and uh, they can, can bust it with their, their hyphae. So, yeah, leach absolutely. minerals. Yep. And they will leach minerals. Yep. Exactly. So I, I wouldn't be surprised about that at all. Um, then that picture on the left, that's, um, that is actually geosiphon with uh, nostoc inside of it. Those little gray circles, those are nostoc uh, punctiformity. What? 
what we call fungus trees. <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah. So they were the first trees, you know, before trees, um, because then by the uh, the Silurian plants had gotten larger, and then by the end of the Devonian, we actually had the 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 pro gymnosperms who were there were trees at that point, and so the, the, you like get a, kind of an arms race where if most of the tree-like forms are relatively low. Anything that can grow higher and catch the sunlight ahead of you and put you in the shade is advantageous. So there was a, a, effectively an arms race of height going on in the development of trees. True. Yeah. Exactly, and they kind of put the the giant fungi out of business as a result of that. So, like, like okay, guys, we, we got this from now on. Pretty much, and so fungi. Have, I mean, they they were the ra- you know they were the Radio Shack of their day, but they had to move on. I wonder how fast these guys sprang up, though. We'll never know for sure. But um, yeah, because, uh, the way I, I, I don't know if, if you any of you all ever witnessed uh, a, a mushroom erupt. It's uh, oh hey, my mantis just jumped on my shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, they, they come up so fast, like within a couple of minutes, they just and they unravel, and it's super complex. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, in uh-huh. principle, paleo. I, I don't know how much yet has been done on the paleogenomics of, of these fossil forms, but it's only a matter of time that they start tinkering around with all the selection dynamics uh, on it and do modeling on it. So that's there. there there's a preview for science of the twenty uh, second century. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So the glomerular. I hardly Makoda. agree, Scott Duke. What happened? Every time we listen in, the topic gets better and better. We got a lot of well. There's so much science out there. It's just, it's just. How can anyone not be curious about all this stuff? That's true. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, are we good on this slide? Anything to add? Uh, I don't think so. This is this weird? How, how? I wonder how far those spores could spread at that height. Probably pretty far. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. How many? Uh, where can we find fossils of those uh, big guys? Is there any place uh, local in the U.S. that we can go see them? There may be. I'm not entirely sure. I don't know what, what their locale was. So that's yeah. a good question. Let me see if I got anything on it. Okay. So Ascomycota. So so the, the name Ascomycota is derived from a structure uh, where the spores are formed called the Ascus. Woo. What a surprise. <laughs> um, this group includes morals, truffles, baker's yeast, cup fungi, ophiocordyceps, and we'll talk about that one shortly, and penicillium. So, a bunch of famous ones. <clears throat> Most of the fungi that we are aware of are either ascomycetes or basidiomycetes. Nothing uh, is, is more awesome than the fact that uh, ophiocordyceps is on this list with all the edible mushrooms and the one we, one we, the, 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 Fungus we, we use for uh, uh, baking and stuff like that. That's that's awesome. Yeah. Like, in fact, since you're here, why don't you tell us about Ophiocordyceps? Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the uh, zombie uh, fungus. I guess is the best way to to, to describe it. They're the uh, the ones that control uh, insects, uh, mostly insects. That control them. Uh, I believe there may be some that affect snails too, because I've. I, I believe I've looked at and seen some some different images of that. Uh, the the symptoms are very uh, very similar to what we saw uh, happening when it, with the the white fluff was erupting out of the uh, out of that what was that old fly you had before or what we saw with mm. our uh, uh, cicadas except for they look like uh, like the devil's fingernails coming out of uh, <laughs> out mm. of the. the uh, mm arthropods body and this doesn't just happen to ants uh, i know people call them oh, this is a zombie ant fungus it can happen to all different uh, uh different clades of uh insects and uh, other arthropods as well i've seen tarantulas uh with it erupting out of them uh it it, it changes their behavior and their their the implications from what we found out looking at the the parasites and the cicadas uh, has led to a lot of speculation that there may be some of these same kinds of uh, of chemical compounds uh, that create uh, substances like the ephedrine and the uh, mm. the, the uh, amphetamines, things like that. I wonder that. if 
if they have, because they have the, the connection to that chitin like system, whether or not there might be a whole ancillary chemistry going on that's given them a little bit of a leg up in invading the chitin based uh, arthropods. Yeah, uh, that's a, I mean, yeah. that's a good, I don't know if there's any work on that, but that's an interesting speculation for sure. That, um, sorry, my dog's uh, going crazy upstairs. Uh, but anyway, it, it, uh, it, changes their behavior. So first of all, uh, lift, uh, it, inserting something like an ephedrine uh, will uh, sate its appetite, will sate the individual's ap appetite. And uh, I'm so sorry, she's up there yip yapping. Uh, just a second. It's like, I want to be on this camera. I, I want to be on the show. I want to be on the show. I want to be on the show. Um, well, well, while we're um, waiting, uh, one of one really interesting fact about Ophiocordyceps is that it didn't, it doesn't, when it gets into the arthropod, it doesn't end up in the brain, which is, I think, the most interesting thing. It ends up on the muscles. So, I, I don't know. I thought that was very interesting when they, uh, when researchers looked into that. Uh, if you are really interested in fungi, there's a book you can read, which I've read, and it's a very good book. It's titled Entangled Life. It's by a guy named Merlin Sheldrake. He's a mycologist. So if you're into that sort of stuff, look it up. It's a good book. I'm just glad. Well, I don't know if you guys does, but it's, so where is the human parasite funguses that affect our brains? Uh, I, I don't think there are really any. <laughs> That infect our brain. Not that I'm aware of. Um, there are those that, you know, get under your your fingernails and toenails and things like that. Yeah. And I think some of those are ascomycetes. Um. Yep. Baker's yeast. That's good old um, bread and beer. Uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, which has been used in some cool experiments. Also, we discussed those in a recent episode. Oh yeah, uh, we talk, the, yeah. We talked about the the selection thing about about how they about how they're like they did yeast to find the better gravity yeast or whatever it was. Yep. And exactly. what kind of a tinkering mind in the past figured that out to develop? Wow! If I get this fungus crap and put it next to this barley and other things, wow! Look what happens. Like, yeast is as right. another thing that's everywhere that you don't even you don't even think about it. We're you you gentlemen are all covered with yeast right now, and frankly, I find it just no, it's it's natural. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But really, really like Darty says, um, we, if we put this stuff in our, in our water, barley water, it tastes ooh, it tastes a lot better or whatever. Yeah. You know, I right. think. That, um different uh different yeast recipes and stuff that, that people are, are throwing together uh to make different kinds of beers. Um, <laughs> you see the uh yeah. the people yeah. using uh like like yeast from their beards and stuff like yeah. that. It's uh, it's it's crazy. And and so it's understandable that inevitably human beings would hit on some of the fungi that have hallucinogenic properties and run with it. Are we going to get into air gut? Um, yeah, we can talk about that. Um, uh, one interesting, um, thing about the baker's yeast is wherever you live on the planet, there are different, um, uh, you know, subspecies or, or, uh, ecomorphs, whatever of Saccharomyces. So wherever you live, your beer is going to taste slightly different. Or your bread is gonna, you know, be slightly different when you use these yeast because they're not all genetically the same. So, if you're, you know, making beer using uh, Saccharomyces up in um, Norway versus down in Egypt, you're gonna be using probably different species or maybe different uh, ecotypes. It really so does. Uh, everyone has their own. Yeah. It really does punctuate the diversity of the gradient uh, of life. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And speaking of other other topic on, on here, the penicillin was that just a rumor, or was that really discovered by was that really discovered by accident that it helped medical? It stuff? was. Yeah. Um. Uh. Alexander Fleming basically left a sandwich on his on his desk, or or well, what is it? He had like a sandwich, and then he had a petri dish open, and some of it had some of the the uh, penicillin had gotten on the petri dish, 
and he realized that it was um it had created a um a oh crap what's a, a zone of inhibition around around the, the the fungi and he was like whoa that's weird and so that was basically the um I believe it was actually the rediscovery of penicillin. I think someone had discovered it a few decades earlier, but it was like lost or the, the research was lost. And yeah, so it had that, to be that was often the case of things that pioneers in fields, if they're in relatively uh, limited areas or if they happen to be women, uh, some yeah. of these things can be known and then forgotten all about. Just right. Like exactly. I think there was a, a, a woman uh, um, who um, found out that the um, is section of the Islamic world had kind of figured out vaccination on their own and that this got lost track of. Uh, and this was back in the 18th century and that they rediscovered mm -hmm. this and finally um, reintroduced it. So a lot of invention going around. With people. Yeah, yeah, kind of sure. like how I heard that the Romans may, may have invented the steam engine a long time ago, but it, it got lost in time for thousands of oh, years. They, 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 they did invent little, well, both the, uh, the Greeks and uh, Romans had knowledge about how steam worked, but they didn't do it for anything. And in part, because they had such a large slave labor force that that would be disequilibrated. What would the slaves do if we replaced them with machines? That's not a bright idea. Yeah, that's kind of weird, steampunky sort of stuff, right there. You know, like yeah. the ancient Romans with with like, you know, uh, um, what do you call it? like air balloons and stuff like that? That'd be weird, sort of but steampunk it, world. But it, 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 so it makes you think about if they kept on that thing with steam engines, of steamboats in the in like the early early BC AD time. Well, what would we be now? The, the uh, James Burke's old connection series brought about a lot of the fact that one of the things that limited technological development had to do with the precision tool aspect of it. And he was making a droll joke, but you really couldn't get industry off the ground until you could really get a good screw. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. The process of making screws, to make a screw, you need a screw shaped thing that you can use as a template for the making of the screw. Well, how do you make the, a screw template? You need a good screw for that. And it was it, that, that precision instrument development uh, and metallurgy that went along with it, that was the underpinning of an awful lot of the Industrial Revolution. Hmm. Uh huh. There you go. There you have it. Are, as well are as the ergots and all of that stuff? Are the ergots Ascomycetes? Because I'm not. I don't know the answer to that one. I'm not. Yeah, that sure connects to Salem it. witchcraft. Yeah, and we yeah. talking about uh, which which salves that you rub on yourself. To, uh, yes, they are. As, uh, ask my my coda. You, you got okay. It. So they're in this group too, which uh, you kind of see some uh, some characteristics that are relative. So yeah, that uh, Linda Caporal had done the first paper on that back in 1976 in Science Magazine, and I think it's pretty much been accepted down the road. The idea that rotting uh, um, bread can uh, um, develop these things and uh, it can slip in. And this would have been happening in various uh, uh, cultures where you would get uh, witchcraft outbreaks that would be basically related to uh, bad, uh, damp bread. It's kind right. of interesting. Uh, they do talk about some of the uh, like recipes uh, that, that they use to make the those the, these salves that these people would rub on themselves to summon the devil or whatever. Uh, and mm -hmm. they'll talk about things like, uh, like uh, robbing uh, uh, graves and stuff. And uh, you think about some of the funguses that you could, uh, you could get into doing that <laughs> as well. So it's, yeah, yeah, it's a, it, it, but ear got, uh, yeah, it was a agricultural thing. I, I, I can imagine that a, a huge outbreak could cause, you know, a whole city to, uh, to hallucinate, depending on you know how the uh, the grain is being dispersed. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, we good on this one? I believe so. Wait, wait, wait. What is the? I can't just be, can, you, can you like? Uh, I, can't, I can't talk right now. Uh, zoom zoom in that little what's that circle thing on Where the on the left side. Oh, yeah. Is that like oh, a, the, uh, the that's the life cycle. Okay. Yeah, that's just the life cycle Could, down there. Couldn't tell because they're kind of small at the time. <laughs> yeah, so this is just showing um, you have the Ascus, which is um, which is up here, or there's a larger one uh, down on the 
sort of the bottom left of it. And so that's where the spores are formed. That's where that's what uh, Eskimycete derives its name from. Good. And so and this uh, shows how complex the the fungus reproduction processes are. And there's not just it's not just a cycle like you see with uh, with like animals with the animal kingdom where you know well for the most part where you you, you when you reproduce and then you pass away there's there's different levels. Uh, that's what I was talking about with the. Uh, one that affected the 17 year locust that it, you know, the one, one phase of it will activate immediately. And the other one goes dormant for 17 years. So different, right. different directions, depending on environmental uh, influences. Right. Right. Exactly. So, yep. Alrighty. Well, it gives us the... bread and beer and also can eat bug butts. Yes. Those are all true things. And finally, the basidia my seats. These are the mushrooms. Everybody's familiar with the mushrooms. I'm familiar with the ones I see in the corner there. Uh, that, that, that is Amanita muscaria. <laughs> so what's of these um, mushrooms? So what's of these mushrooms give you extra life? Which one which ones make you grow bigger? Uh well <laughs> definitely not these. In fact, the the little red mushrooms that with the white spots that you see, which are also the ones you might get in Mario, those will kill you if you try to eat them in real life. So don't do that. Oh, they're, um, so they're the, the mushrooms from the lost levels then. <laughs> Let's not do that. Um, so <laughs> Amanita muscaria is a is a, a, a species of Basidiomycete, and if you look at it, there's a little kind of skirt structure on the stalk. It has a skirt and it has a very large base. Looks kind of like an onion at the base, so you can't really see it because it's covered with the soil and whatnot. Um, but if you <laughs> Don't put it in your mouth. Please don't put it in your mouth because you will not have time to get to the hospital. <laughs> it's just over. Just, yeah. you know, say goodbye. It's over. Don't be, don't be experimenting with these things. Yep. Yep. Don't eat mushrooms you find in the woods unless you're like There's very no experienced. That, that mushrooms are one of the things that murder mystery people would pay attention to as a way of bumping somebody off. Yeah. Unless you're like very experienced and you know how and where to look for mushrooms and things. Don't don't eat random mushrooms. So, um, what spore... morale looks like because they're not colorful. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Morals. Um, what is the other one? Uh, chanterelles. Uh, truffles. Yeah. Well, I, I think generally speaking, grow really don't they? bright colors yeah, like that out. is nature's way of saying back off. Yeah. Aposematic coloration. Exactly. Yep. So the spores are formed in the structure called the basidium. Hence, Basidiomycete. This, this group includes mushrooms, puffballs, uh, smuts, rusts, and chanterelles. Um, rusts are a very bad, uh, well, for us, uh, type of fungus because these um, will wipe out whole uh, wheat crops. They're very, very bad in that regard. Um, and the, one of the, the bad things about it is they use plants that grow near the crop as an intermediate host. So basically jump to the wheat, kill it off, and then jump back to the the plants nearby. And then they'll jump back again. <laughs> so it doesn't yeah, matter. I think you... it was a fungi that did in the uh, um, uh, French uh, European uh, uh, wine crops back in the 19th century. So yeah, that's probably a speaking, rust. All yeah. of the European wines today are actually taken from grafts from California grapes. It, wasn't there one? Wasn't there one species that had that they found growing in like southern Newfoundland or something that that they think was brought over in like the colonial era that maybe uh Europe one of the old European species? I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, is it is it fungus or bacteria that's killing the bananas right now? Um, are you talking about a, the? Could be the, either. <laughs> Are you are you talking about what wiped out the uh, what was it the the gross Michael? Because right now we well we eat Cavendish right, but like yeah, like the banana flavored candy and stuff, the banana flavored anything is based on the flavor of what a gross Michael used to taste yeah. like. But mm. the, the, I, I, the I heard the bar died out. I heard the new ones are dying off too. I'm not sure, but yeah, well that's because it's the way we do cultivars. Uh, cultivars is basically inbreeding things until you get to, to do what you want it to do and then you start adding a little genetic diversity here and there but you can't add too much because you'll lose the traits that you've been yeah. trying to select for 
Um, monocultures are always risky, whether it's plants or industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll top it again. There's like it's all before in the plant one. Like we do that with apples too. That we just we find the one we like. This keep on cloning it. Yep, pretty much. Yeah, that's exactly what we do. Um, and then these are well, uh, one subset of of Basidiomycetes can degrade lignin. Those are called the uh, agaricomycetes. And agaricomycetes, actually, um, Brainbug mentioned the horizontal gene transfer from bacteria. Agaricomycetes actually got their lignin degrading enzymes from bacteria horizontally. And so those were transferred to fungi, and uh, and and then um, after. I so think the we referred forest, to a little bit of that uh, lignin degradation issue in our rocks were there book. Yeah, so by the rocks were there. Um, <laughs> Part uh, two. So my copies on my Kindle. So we had the, um, the the coal forests, which were the result of basically trees falling over and then just just piling up. Yeah, piling up, getting covered by sediment, and forming these huge uh, coal seams. And then it wasn't until uh, lig er, lignin degrading fungi basically came about that the the coal forest uh, couldn't really pile up anymore because now something is degrading the trees. Yeah, and even then it was kind of a slow go from the time that the, the genetic systems uh, developed to do that to where they actually started kicking in. But eventually it reached the stage where if a tree falls in the forest, it ain't going to stay there long because the fungi are going to dissolve it. Exactly. Yep. Yep. They create, they, they make their little, uh, their, their mycelia all through the, the tree and, and degrade it bit by bit. Nature's nature's little recyclers. Yeah. And they've been and, doing it a lot longer than animals or plants have. So yeah. you're a lot better yep. at it. Yep. So that's the end of, of my PowerPoint. What else would we like to add? Oh, uh, so I, I, I think you mentioned this before, for the, before, but how the, uh, some, fu some fungi actually help, help plants with the, with the like, internet underground. Yeah, they, they form a, a whole um, interconnection between plants, between other fungi, with uh, bacterial you know, colonies. They, they uh, interconnect everything you know, together in a sense, and they can distribute nutrients from one plant to another you know, if, if need be, because you are taking nutrients in part from these plants, and so the more you can keep alive in your immediate area the better off you are. You know, if one of them dies, okay, well, I still have these other ones. And so, yeah, they're sort of cultivating plants in, in that sense, just as we do. Uh, that we didn't talk about the stoned ape hypothesis yet. Ah, oh. yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, go ahead, is, RJ. It's one that is um, a tantalizing prospect, but alas, doesn't hold up much. We do know human beings certainly do a heck of a lot of drugs. They, they figure out all sorts of ways to, to get to high on uh, lots of things. But the particular hypothesis was that the Australopithecines got going on the brain thinky stuff because they were getting high on uh, various hallucinogens and other things. The problem is, is the ones that they might have made use of don't live where the Australopithecines are. So it, the, it never really matched up very well. And it's fair to say that although you have uh, some advocates of it still kind of lurking around the fringes of uh, paleoanthropology, it hasn't caught on very well. So and it's, and it's kind of in the same ballpark as the also now defunct aquatic ape hypothesis for the <laughs> origin of humans. Silly RJ, the, the R I can't pronounce, I can't, I can't pronounce these words. The R they picked it up on the way home from the ark. They got when they, yeah, when yeah, they that, in the ark. That's when they got the mushrooms. Well, we know that Noah uh, was an alcoholic because he just really had a big bender after the flood, and one of his kids saw him naked. I mean, this is all scripture. You know, you can't argue with that. 
So why wouldn't they have all of this hallucinogenic stuff? You know, did they have like a stash down there underneath the Gila monsters, you know, that they didn't want to let Shem know about? I don't well, know. They, well, they had to have the seeds, the plants and mushrooms to grow them after the two of each kind of mushrooms to get each kind of uh, plants, you know. For How some reason, creationists don't blood. think a lot about mushroom sex. You know what I would like to know? Because it's it you you wouldn't necessarily have had two of every fun fungus. You would have had however many mating types there are of every fungus. Bingo. Oh. So can you yeah, imagine if like one species has like five hundred mating types? You got to have a spore for every mating type. If you want to something, if you want something that is like in the really long term, hell will freeze over before it happens thing. Just wait around for any really serious systematics by barominologists on the fungi. Yeah, that reminds me. How it, it must be they, they have a hard enough time doing kind of, of animals. What's what are the kinds of fungi? Oh, they just don't think they don't about care. It. They don't care. Yeah. <laughs> because That's more of in the same way than anything. And brain bug, uh, mm. you should be offended as well because the creationists just don't want to ever think about whether there were any bugs on the ark. Right. I, I was just saying the other night that the only uh only thing I've ever seen AIG talk about uh was uh, you know they post their, their nonsense on, on mm -hmm. Twitter was uh, regarding bugs was this write up that they said that all these insects survived like hiding inside uh basically like driftwood and floating forests. Mm -hmm. yeah, oh, yeah, the floating Bob forest floating hypothesis. Forests. Yeah, we've, we've yes, seen it. Yes. Yeah, but, Which but, has the one minor problem is that it's incredibly silly. Yeah, yeah, the bugs can survive 40 days or more on this floating forest during massive rainstorms and stuff, but the monkeys can't survive a week or two on the on no. about the same reason the South they're, America. They're really forced into it because, first of all, other than locusts and that kind of bunch, flies and things that were commonly known to human beings who lived in around Ur of the Chaldees, they would know about that from their daily life. But the vast range of insects, let alone the vast range of fungi, are just off their scope. Now, you, you'd think God would have known about it as the designer, so he would have been completely up on all of this, but didn't send any memo downstream into the into the Genesis tale. And so the people who have answers in Genesis are trying to deal with this stuff really restrict themselves to vertebrates and very narrow ranges of vertebrates at that. And, th and therefore, when they try to deal with the fossil record, they're just kind of shutting them aside. Yeah, because you got to give... You got to give the the Ark Encounter props at least for giving it a try, uh, because they did include dinosaurs and uh, um, the therapsids and all that on board the Ark, uh, basically families uh, as the kinds. But they also had to acknowledge that after the Ark settled on Ararat, over half of them went extinct. Y yeah, but RJ, amphibians like the water; they were fine. Yeah, they're no problem. Yeah, sure. Uh, and then, of course, they also have to figure out where they're going to be distributed to. I mean, it, it, not nearly the sheer number of insects. Just plow your way through half a million species of beetles. Uh, but not only that, but also there's very specialized distribution around the planet. And any shred of biogeographical plausibility for pre-flood, flood, post-flood post environment is going to just get shredded by the bugs. But, but speaking of insects and fungi, uh, Brian... You want to talk about our our fungus farmers, the ants? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The uh, so leaf cutter ants. You ever see? Uh, you know when they show the, the the videos of the African savanna, there's inevitably the the ants carrying the leaf. The leaf cutter ants. They're marching in a straight line. Uh, our zoo in St. Louis has an excellent exhibit uh, of leaf cutter ants in their. Uh, in their insect house. So if you ever get a chance to go in there, it, it runs all throughout the building and they just march, carry leaves and they carry it back to uh, a, a, basically a, it's, it's a, it's a dry storehouse is what it is. Um, and they carry it back and, and put it down in there because they're farming fungus and the fungus is uh, decomposing the leaves. And as it decomposes them, it really, it opens up its fruiting bodies. They, uh, uh, feed on that. That's what they're actually eating. So leaf cutter ants don't actually eat the lance or eat the uh, the the plants. And this is, uh, as far as we can tell, uh, the something they've been doing since the uh, the late uh, Jurassic. So 
they beat us to agriculture by uh, how many millions of years? I can't like even, over 100, 150 150 million years. Like, yeah. I, again, they beat us to land, they beat us to the air, they beat us to agriculture. And they farm livestock too, but we can't, unfortunately, right. we can't right. we can't track that as well because we can see their the, their, their dry storehouse chambers in the fossil record. Like, the, like, the, like, the, like the alphas and stuff? Yeah, but they, but the, yeah, the aphids they 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 farm those free range, so right. uh, they don't that there's no fossil record for that. Right, aphids, we found them. Uh, some caterpillars, things like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's really cool. That is really neat. Speaking and we can ask the creationists: Were those particular symbionts and aphid connections and all of that present on the ark? Or did it all happen after the Tower of Babel when Adam sinned and therefore ants took up a uh, aphid uh, farming? You know, I mean, what exactly is their scenario? Share share my uh, share my screen real quick. Uh, okay, uh, check out what I found today. I, I, this is not photoshopped or anything. This is the color that this that this fungus actually is. Um, uh, I have the name of it. Uh, Can we make it any larger, or is as large as it is? That I'm sharing it through. Okay. Twitter. Hold on. Well, that what is it? So you said it's a fungus. Do you know what kind of fungus it is? Yeah. Oh, I have the name on the the post. It's a it's a Latin name. Uh, this this word right here. <laughs> I I can't see that. So the per, it, it, oh, the, hold on. Let me try. Let me try it. On the, on the log. Kita, Fenero Kita, uh Chrysosporium. Oh. Okay, yeah. that's better. There we go. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that gorgeous? Cool. It's, 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 uh, yeah. They call it a uh, crust uh, a crust fungus. Uh, this is a, actually, a, they call this one the cobalt crust fungus, which I think cobalt is blue. I would call this an amethyst crust fungus, but I don't get to name the funguses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, it's I a just, good name. I just thought it was it was just gorgeous. I actually took it home and, and uh, put it in my rose bush. I hope it it does flourish under there because it's it's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely, it's very pretty. Yeah. So yeah, it might be argued that one of the reasons why the fungi are so diverse and relentless is because they've specialized in a lot of basically chemical factory things, as opposed to us boring vertebrates that have generated these big bag like tissue blobs where we have like a little fermentation bat in our stomach but you know nothing too sophisticated we just go really primitive as, as opposed to the relentlessly sophisticated tiny little cellular factory operations that excrete stuff all over the place and symbiotically connect up with things promiscuously uh, that make them very uh, powerful as an organism line yeah it's like avatar yeah. <laughs> They're all connected in together, and well, yeah, they they were clearly uh, he was riffing off of that mycelium concept mm -hmm. to the idea uh, that if you think about a mycelium communication system in a way as a giant nervous system, is it possible that you know a forest has kind of like air quotes mind? Yeah, and it's one of those unanswerable questions. In the same way that um, uh, if you want a book that's very long but deliciously thought provoking. Um, Hofstetter's good old Escher Bach uh, still holds good. He was written back in the 1970s, uh, and it, it's just an amazing riff off of what does it mean to be life? What does it mean to be mind? What, what exactly are the criteria for things? And, and given what we know about mycelium and various other things today, um, it's, it's still a thought-provoking notion. Is there a mind in an ant colony, for example, even though there are no conventional neurons and nobody's in charge nonetheless things are information is passing back and forth in a way that is there a collectivity there and what does it mean if it isn't our head just a collective mass of neurons and yet we have a, a, a self-awareness at the same time so what exactly right. are the boundary lines on there i don't have any answers to that by the way but you know after you've taken your hallucinogenic mushroom you can think <laughs> about such concepts and and wonder, hey man, wow! That's how hey you man. connect to the to the to the mycelial network, man. There you go. Actually, yeah. <laughs> um, so in the book Entangled, wait, were, were you here when I was tell, telling them about Entangled Life? I think you went to. Oh, I think I, I had to step out because my daughter. Um, yeah. There's a really good book titled Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake. It's all about fungi, their evolution, things like that. Yeah, and yeah. Um, 
uh, uh, Robert Sheldrake or uh, uh, Merlin Sheldrake. Oh, there you go. Because yeah, there was a Rob, uh, another Sheldrake that's kind of odd. <laughs> um, but uh, the that. very the first uh, chapter is he talks about um, uh, doing shrooms under like uh, in a for a medical experiment, basically. Um, and they're asked to, to think about it's it's like some scientists, some mycologists, and they take mushrooms and they're asked to think about whatever problem they're thinking about currently. And you know, do they feel more clear headed thinking about this problem or something like that? And it was, it was kind of interesting. And um, he does a few other things like that throughout the book. Um, but it's a really cool book. Uh, he talks about ophiocordyceps and the the mycelial connections between uh, plants and other fungi, things like that. So mm -hmm. definitely That's worth reading. That's actually something we didn't get into too much on this stream tonight. But how, you know, you all know how much of our, our pharmaceuticals are based on these uh, these compounds that funguses produce. I mean, yeah, uh, all of them, all of the. Oh yeah, that. ergotamines and lots uh, of other stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah it, uh, it can be argued that between fungi and plants, that is the pharmaceutical industry. Right. Yeah. Uh, amphetamines, uh, most uh, uh, like uh, antipsychotic medications have mm -hmm. uh, uh, a, a fungal base for the com for the active compounds, uh, and how some of these. Oh my gosh, we can get into how they, they've uh, developed these compounds, how these compounds are produced, and what the animal kingdom beyond just us have done with those compounds. It's, it's, uh, it's yeah. Na Nature has had several billion years of experimental lab work under its um, uh, bit to do that, whereas... We humans have to do things at a very, very tidy, short range thing. So let's look at what the experiments nature did. They've done a lot of it ahead of us. Speaking of medicine and pharmacy and back to penicillin, I, I heard that the penicillin might not be effective anymore because of the uh, evolution of bacteria have evolved. Oh, yeah, that's world. inevitable. Well, I mean, yeah, that's, it, it's, that's it's already almost true, extinct, I believe. Uh, it's a dynamic function. Um, that, um, and and it's, it was only accelerated by how much it was used. So the overuse, yeah. they, they now have to use evolutionary dynamics. Spoiler alert, creationists, they got to pay attention to the evolutionary dynamics. That if you misuse how you apply a bacterial um, uh, agent or a, a viral agent, um, it can have side effects because your organisms can become resistant to them more easily. That's why they have to even be careful as to how many times they do it and what populations they're dealing with it and how quickly they're administered. All of these things can nudge you into a mode where it accelerates the, the speed with which the organism can become resistant to it. Yeah, I, I, I right. talked about this yeah. with, with, with Dan during our virus episode or vaccine episode about how uh, some people are starting to use uh, bacterial phages to attack bacteria because they can evolve along with the bacteria. Yeah, I'm, and yeah, that that's, um, yeah, that has been used. But I, I do believe the, um, the original um, species of penicillin that was originally used, which is a penicillium uh, chrysogenum, is already out of circulation because the uh what is it is it beta lactams that it produces i think mm. um to yeah. to disrupt the the cell wall formation of of there bacteria. can never That's... be an eden there can never be a, a, an no. idyllic perfection because everything has downsides everything can mutate Right. Everything cross connects with everything else. Whenever you think you've got, uh, it, it's no coincidence, the implications of that arms race metaphor, that there's no such thing as the ultimate weapon. Or, or, or I suppose the only ultimate weapon would be your species goes extinct, in which case yeah. you didn't win. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, that's, that's what happens. Uh, the things evolve. So are you guys familiar with the uh, con? If I if I put these three concepts, the mushroom, the reindeer, and the shaman together, do you know what I'm talking oh, about? Santa Claus, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean that goes back to your stoned ape thing, right? But you know that, yeah. that they used to, it, the reindeer would eat the mushroom, um, and then the the shaman would drink the reindeer's pee. Uh, that's not a joke. That's actually. I, I, so uh, I have well, now, my, now that's a tradition professor. we want to bring back to our mall Santas. Oh, I so thought you were going to say my botany professor uh, is very <laughs> interested in history, and he did actually talk about that a little bit 
in our so class. You should, you should be leaving out. You shouldn't be leaving out a glass of milk with the cookies. Is what I'm saying. Oh, thank well, you. Then there's that weird brand of coffee that's done by having the uh, the, the coffee beans run through a sieve. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I and mean, what what, what person thinks of these things to begin with? Yes, it turns out okay, but but what kind of mind is it that that thought of trying that to begin with? <laughs> Uh, the same thing could be said of an egg, couldn't it? it this yeah, bird yeah. pooped egg out this white out thing. Let's eat it. I think I'll try to eat it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, uh, back to the mushroom real fast, uh, uh, Brian. Uh, the the farmer, the mushroom farmers, the ants. Are the, have, the, have the mushrooms they 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 make have have they speciated enough as, uh, as much as mushrooms can speciate? To, yes, to there's there's uh, distinct species of them uh, in different different regions. So. <laughs> Uh, every time I start talking, <laughs> somebody must be walking by with a dog. Uh, so every time uh, there's there's multiple uh, different uh, different species over a geographic region and within the populations of ants because different species of ants have domesticated different funguses, but they use the same basic process. So I we we think that it's a, a, a direct ancestral behavior it's not it, we don't think that it's a behavior that necessarily evolved multiple times we could we could find out that it has but the methodology is pretty consistent across the board and i and i heard the the when the queens leave they take the mushrooms with them a spore with them they do they take the spores with them they uh they so the queens uh or when the they do this these things called nuptial flights uh, where they spread out to go create their own colonies and the, the, the females will have the wings, uh, the young females. But two things that they want to have when they leave, they want to have uh, have mated with a, with a male um, and they will want to have grab some spores because when they establish their new colony, they're going to lay their eggs and they need some of those eggs to be, uh, to be females. So the only way that can happen is if they mate because otherwise... Her whole first brood is going to be a bunch of lazy males that won't do anything, and, all, and it'll just be her and her, you know, small group of uh, of male uh, ants, and they'll just die. Yeah. Yep. Such is life. Uh, yeah. So, Insects, the matriotic flow of the animal family. Maybe, maybe, brain bug here should have a future presentation about insects. Yeah. We could definitely do that. I don't get tired of talking about insects. <laughs> it, it, it isn't as though there aren't a few to talk about. There, there's like maybe one or two. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. Me and Brady like already talked about how insects beat us to land. They beat us to air. They now they beat us to farming. Yeah. <laughs> they've, they've, and they certainly reinforce the, the the point that among animals, most animals fly. Flight is really a valuable characteristic, and if you can figure out how to do it. Boy, that that's an advantage, and the insects have done that with a vengeance. You know what's funny about ants, though, is for the most part they gave it up. They're like, yeah, you know what? We don't really need it, and nothing. Yeah. Uh, people always ask me, like, if uh, if insects were uh, were larger, like carboniferous size, if we got those oxygen levels now, what would the world look like? I'd be like, it would just be a big giant ant colony because they'd wipe every living thing off this planet as soon as they were. Yeah, you'd have big millipeds yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and ants. I I I watch these videos about ants. They can tear. They can once they get something that they tear the that they like the meat. They they get they go mm. for it. Yeah, yeah. scorpion. Well, to this run day, no, nothing can stop an army ant. Oh, driver ants. Yeah, definitely they are. Uh, you see, they they build those uh, biovox and stuff that they that they, they can build bridges and chains and they'll, they'll they've, you know, they've anybody who's uh, like laid up like if you're if you're unable to move uh, whether it's a baby or an elderly person they can they'll they'll come in and start eating you. They they probably, they can stop a army the, the driver ants or army ants are probably the fungus ant fungus. <laughs> You all remember walking with monsters? Uh, yeah. They had the uh, the ants that mm -hmm. came and ate the baby. Uh, or was that? that no, that was that was, terror, walking. That was walking with beasts. That walking was walking with beasts. beasts. The terror, the terror, the terror, the terror, terror birds. Bird, yeah, there weren't ants in walking with monsters because it takes place in the Paleozoic. In the Paleozoic, yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they had those giant spider things and the giant dragonflies, but yeah, which yeah, actually the, the giant spider the was wrong. Yeah, well, the, the, the intelligent designers. Yeah. 
But yeah, they the only thing that Terror Birds were scared of was the, the ant in the babies. <laughs> that comes with, with having uh, a nest in general. You gotta you gotta be able to protect your young. Any, yeah. any, whether they're they're eggs or they're uh, underdeveloped uh, offspring, <laughs> you can't protect them from uh, from the natural natural ecology around you. It's, yeah, ter but yeah, but terror birds, the last whole doubt of, of the dinosaurs were dominant. <laughs> yeah, they, they went down Penguins all the way down. Pretty much taken over animal. Antarctica. <laughs> very, very effective predators until the leopard showed up. Upset their apple cart. Uh, I think well, they they're still pretty much wire. taking over New Zealand, haven't they? Still, that's uh, still primarily avifauna, isn't it? <laughs> an invasive species, and, uh, and they they don't do well. Uh, but kiwis, the birds. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, kiwis, kakapo. You know, uh, the the uh, like was it elephant birds or whatever? Yeah, they don't yeah, have the anymore. Yeah, but for, for, the for Madagascar. Well, for the longest time, uh, all, all it was sorry, not not elephant birds. Yeah, yeah, probably, well, for the longest time until humans showed up, the only thing they had to deal with the marsupials. <laughs> well, we're terrible about that. I mean, well, well, they're 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 the victims of uh, what is it? Uh, Foster's rule. So that's that's not uh, Foster's uh, rule. Don't even get me started on Foster's rule. <laughs> Are we gonna do this? Not right now. No, there's, there's no. I, I could go on for another hour and a half on Foster's don't rule. Don't get him started on Foster's rule. I told you, don't get me started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's gonna have to be another show. That'd have to be another show, exactly. <laughs> yeah. The, the 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 neat thing about the fungi is that now that they can study the genes of them and look at all the dynamics of them, I I'd say that there's probably more to be understood about them because so little of them are so much as is just being discovered. So if, if it's a field that's that's mycology ain't going to slow down over the next fifty years. Oh no, no, it's probably going to get it's probably going to get um, increasingly uh, important, especially in agriculture, because yeah. one of the things we need to focus on is the actual mycorrhizal associations yeah. in the soil. That's oh, yeah. one of the things about that uh, regarding putting nutrients back into the soil. It's oh, not yeah. just it's not just cycling your plants; it's also the fungi. This is a yeah, critically gotta, important part. Yeah, we got to start do, uh, breeding the f more fungi that works with plants and, and, and that's clean plants. <laughs> like, okay. Scott Duke's trying to go. Yeah. No, not today. <laughs> Maybe next time. <laughs> so, so is, so is, before we go, is lichen, is that like the plant? Yes. Yeah. That, plant? that was the other thing we forgot. I, oh, I, I fungi, forgot my fungi and bacteria. Um, my well, understanding of it was fungi that, and algae and bacteria. Yeah. Oh, that they have no, a triple threat. And yeah. it was not at all clear up until fairly recently who was getting the advantage out of this. And so there was some suspicion that the lichen was actually kind of enslaving the, the symbionts and it was getting the better end of the deal. But I think the re more recent work has tended to look at it a little bit better into where it is kind of a more mutualistic relationship. It wasn't quite as lopsided as they saw bought 30 years ago. So, uh, so Scott, so do contact me on Twitter and I'll send you a paper on it, which so, is so, a pretty good summary. So like it was more symbiotic than parasitical then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the idea because it's, it turns out it's actually, there's like, or I think at least, or one of the cool things is it's like an algae and then a basidiomycete and then an ascomycete and also bacteria in there. And they're all yeah. in this one association together. Um, and when you look at it, you think, it's like oh, what a cute ecology. little plant. But yeah. it's not a plant. And it's not even a single thing. It's a committee. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, I, I knew about the fungi and the and the algae, but I did not know bacteria was involved too. Yeah, it's the union yeah. of the three kingdoms. Yep, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, well, and, and a, I think a domain that, and, it, yeah. it's only because they're relatively small organisms that you look at, oh, the cute little plant, isn't that sweet? Not realizing what an immensely complicated biological ecosystem all that is. And again, were they on the ark? Hey, hey, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 plants, well, plants survived after all. Cause we, at least all those plants, at least all the plants survived because they got an olive branch. Yeah. yeah. Well, one way or another, uh, and your, your plants, your insects, your fungi are are durable for a jolly good reason. 
they have a variety of adaptive skills that make them very, very effective in spreading themselves around it. And although we like to be really pushy because we're the fancy vertebrates, you know, the build airplanes and things, but as, as a group, we, are, we have relatively few species uh, and, and don't last all that long. And uh, it's uh, our, our uh, extinctions, I mean, compared to uh, so many of these immensely successful fungi, saber tooth cats are like a washout. <laughs> right. Let me make you think. What what ate and decomposed the, the decomposers like fungi? Other fungi. Uh, other fungi, bacteria. Yeah. Yeah. It's a circle. They're the, they're the little cleanup crew, uh, and then some insects that help clean up. And even there, you know, the, the fact that uh, termites do not eat wood. It's the gut microbia in the termites that actually digest the wood. Right. So the, the whole idea of how relentlessly symbiotic our own thing, the microbiomes that we have in our stomach uh, um, and that you pass on um, through, the, through uh, uh, sexual reproduction via the mother, uh, that, that was not even a thing when I was growing up. And there's whole uh, um, careers built on the study of all of that stuff is a, a reason once they understood what was going on in the last 20 years or so. So anybody that's trying to make sense out of the pageantry of life that doesn't think in these multidisciplinary synergistic ways is just way behind the curve. Uh, yeah. uh, so before, before we go, yeah, you, you buy you, you anything coming up on your channel that you want to advertise? Oh, I'm going to be debating. Uh, I'm doing South a Cordova. series on my channel. Yeah, what day is that again? Cordova. Tell us about that. Sal Cordova next week. I'll be debating him on modern day debate things. Uh, the the topic I wanted was: Can there even be an intelligent design model? You know, and Sal did not want that topic. No, Baba. He just wants it a generic. Is there evidence for intelligent design? Well. Uh, I, I'm making no secret of it. I'm going to be talking about the lack of model. <laughs> and I'll be able to call attention to the fact that Erica, in her wondrous long discussion with, with Gunter Beckley, uh, pretty much established that Beckley doesn't have a model either, uh, that the, the, this is a 100% failure rate. And so um, uh, I'll, be, I'll be responding to Sal's origins or bust stuff and all the stuff that you expect Sal to be talking about. But I'm going to be hammering in on the fact that that they don't have a model and they can't have a model because it's wrong. So they're never going to be able to pull that off. Yeah, if we get to Jackson and uh, Brian's thing, it's, 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 I hate that they can't stay on one topic or they stick on one, one, one topic thing. They have to go variety. Yeah. Show. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, Sal is not the most unpredictable of persons. I mean, he tends to have a relatively narrow rut uh, and he'll be bringing up. Uh, the origin of cellular systems and uh, uh, whatever the, the the little buzzword that he was fiddling with uh, that he's been working with Sanford on, and uh, that's kind of how it goes. But they're never going to come up with a model. No. But, you know, but it's also it's bad sometimes that that we know more about creationism than they know about themselves. Oh, that's reasons. not bad at all. It's like we know, about <laughs> their, we know more about their own theories than they don't know about their their. Yeah, what you need to actually what you need to do. And that's why uh, the, the various people who have said that you can learn science from studying creationism is in a way true in that in order to figure out why they have their head up their ass, you'll learn a lot. Yeah. But I know exactly. way more in just the work that I've done with Jackson on the answers in Genesis issues with the rocks were there than I did before. And I knew I know way more about evolution than I did when I was growing up in uh, high school and college uh, because of researching all of that stuff. So it, it's an excellent springboard in figuring out, first of all, why you believe what you do and also why it is that the other position yeah, has problems. And to do that, you've got to dive into sources. You have to conceptualize clearly what you think. And then you can start spotting how the other side doesn't do that very well. Indeed. Uh, yeah. um, over on my channel, uh, we are doing a deep dive of the book, The Ancestor's Tale. We're talking about early um, humans right now, early anatomically yeah. modern humans. So you're or, or, sorry. Off it. that'll be in the next video. We're talking about the 
the uh, the origin of of agriculture actually in the next oh, video. So, so you, haven't, you haven't got to the the chimp split yet, then? <laughs> no, that's going to be a few episodes down the way. Yeah, yeah. Yep. The interesting the interesting dynamic about that agriculture bit is the extent to which it wasn't necessarily a labor saving thing. That the amount of effort that you have to put into agriculture is actually a lot, and you can often get by more easily in hunter gatherer societies. However. It affords you things and inevitably leads to differentiation of labor and social stratification and kings and writing and artwork and chariots and warfare and um, uh, burning heretics. And, you know, it, it just opens up a whole mass of things. It took a few thousand years to work that out. But nonetheless, uh, that ultimately is from the fact that we grow all these bloody plants that are connected to those fungi, which completes the circuit of our discussion. So, 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 Jackson, I can have a, a, at least a video per, per per chapter, like for each meeting place, get its own video. Um, just for the tales, just for each of the tales. Uh, so, yeah, so although there's an awful lot in it, so there's plenty of. I mean, yeah, there he has. I think it's, I think it's what was it, forty eight or forty nine tales. So we're gonna be at this yeah. uh, series for a little while. Oh, yeah, we yeah, so we uh, did the first one, and now we're working on. Or the the second one's nearly done, and so. Yeah, I, I think my I think my favorite my favorite parts of the, the, that book you know I read are, are, are the actually two parts that don't even have to do with Tilda itself. It's the one chapter between where we meet where the mammals meet the amphibians that all those that lines there you know like the missing links there and then the where where the where we go from our eukaryotic to uh. The backward evolution, not backward, not backward evolution. What I'm thinking, whatever it's called, backwards forward story of the between the eukaryotes and the and the archaeans. Well, yeah. two chapters. Uh, okay, but what about, exactly. Okay, about you, brain bug. What's coming up? All right. Um, well, I have. Uh, it should be coming out uh, this Wednesday. I have a uh, video that I worked on with. Uh, Kenneth Leonard responding to uh, Brian Holdsworth's video called Darwin's Bald Spot. Uh, so we go, we're doing a, it's kind of a, just a silly response to it, but uh, we do, we do, uh, I do get to teach some science and he gets to teach some logic. So it's, we, we kind of take advantage of it. And then um, after that, uh, you know, I really don't have anything on the, on the schedule. Oh, I guess I'm going to be on uh, Truth Wanted on the fourth. Uh, so at the Colin show, I and I will be, of course, uh, doing filling my regular role uh, as a co-host on the perspective as well. So check that out over there on your friendly neighborhood atheist. Mm. Nice. And as for me, I gave up a chance to debate Nephilim free tonight to be on our show here, and Wait. boy, am I glad I could be on the RJ, show. RJ, RJ, James also asked me, and I told him I would rather drink drink bleach than debate nephilim yeah. again yeah it, it's so. reached the point yeah that it, uh, uh I, I i any excuse oh my i have to hang up laundry right yeah pretty much good i Lord. asked yeah. i asked erica to see if she could get uh james to have to let me debate uh hans worm hat on on the channel about fake animals <laughs> mm. what does that mean <laughs> oh at, at that bureau over in the cryptozoology department and what all oh. uh do you all know who hans worm hat is no, no, the no. name doesn't. He thinks ring a bell. like uh, the the koalas are fake. The great white sharks oh. are fake. Oh, then he is an idiot. Oh, he's yeah, a total no. idiot. He's That's hilarious, just... though. Oh my gosh, he's like you'll show him. Is pictures he a po? Of... Is he actually I just don't a know. po? Uh, go check out his channel. He did this. Mm. Uh, I got a response video coming out to that in the future yeah. too. But check him out. <laughs> he's uh, and I and I want to show him videos where he can't because he said like uh, like a shoe that the shoe bill was a. Uh, a Fake animal that was invented in the nineties that he no one had ever even Why? heard of before that, and it's like, oh my god, I had him at the zoo when I was a kid in the eighties. Did you see yeah, that? Yeah, like what the beard? Heck? You're a little. Yeah. You you're being assaulted by mm -hmm. a a mantis. Yep, I am. It's like it, it it likes to jump on my face. My ghost mantis is bread. They uh they haven't oh shed my god. It yet, but they they were getting it on the other night when I come down here, and I got some of it on. I got so some pictures. Did, did, you, did you get them? Did, did you did you watch the female eat the male? I cannot did, believe you just did, you just have a mantis on your face. Is that is that bothering yeah. you? No, <laughs> it's no. Uh, but uh, 
she the ghost mantises aren't bad like that. They are uh, they they will they won't generally eat their mates. Uh, they can actually live communally uh, for the most yeah, part. Yeah, I think there's some mantises. I, I, I'm trying to remember channeling that uh, oh, uh, Dr. Tatiana's uh, sex advice thing where, where she collects all of the various sexual activities and insects are usually it. I seem to think it was a, a mantis, one of the species that basically mates for a really long time. It stays in there for like a week or more to make sure nobody else can get in. Uh Mantises do that, but phasmids do that too. And phasmids will actually, they'll, uh, their, their, their sir say they'll actually grab onto the female and multiple males might grab onto it and they'll sit there and, and hang from her. And she's huge. She's like, compared to them anyway, she's huge in most mm. phasmids. So she's, she's, uh, uh, hanging there, this big giant, uh, female, uh, leaf insect or stick insect. And then she's got, uh, you know, a couple of males duking it out, hanging from their sir say on her abdomen, just punching each other. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. and I, I can't. I don't. Before, I don't know if Walker's still in chat, but next week, him and Eric are, are going to be on my channel talking about the uh, ha, the hominemina, 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 hominemina. Yeah. <laughs> are they allowed to do that on YouTube? <laughs> we're we're going to find out. <laughs> Everything from from when the chimps we flip for the chimps from the earth from the from the African African of I can't pronounce these words. That's why you know, this means. Yeah, to them, to the to the, all the homogeneous, everything in between. Yeah, everything from. I, I can remember how scandalous it was uh, in the old days. They kind of gotten used to the fact that our genus is homo. So the fact that that was connected to homosexuality and that, and all of that that buzzword bit, you know, they up, up, uh, the, at least the creationists that have finally have gotten over their chagrin at that and can just simply say the genus name without getting all disturbed. <laughs> I, so, yeah. I, I, I am in the camp that we should be called uh, Australopithecine uh, sapien, but that's because uh, monophyl. <laughs> so. Yeah, that yeah. Yeah. Well, also, and, and, okay, yeah, that's exactly, but... yeah. Uh, eh, no, wrong. <laughs> so aren't we still therapsids? And uh, I mean, okay, but okay, but 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 that's that's I that's not a good. We are in the group. The species mm. is not the overall clade. All right. If you want to, if you want to have that fight, I'll fight you, brain bug. I will fight you on that. <laughs> We're gonna. Hey, that, actually, that actually that, that'd be pretty good. Pretty good. Actually, actually, a good debate to have between you and brain bug. That the yeah. creationist evolution debate we've heard like twenty. And although it's kind of been settled, there there is still little flirtations in the systematics ones that when they're looking at some of the, the, the edgy ends of the homo genus and the edgy ends of the Australopithecines, it's still an issue of, well, isn't this maybe an, just an advanced Australopithecine? That shows you how blurry the lines are between uh, the uh, the non-robust Australopithecines and uh, homo uh, um, uh, habilis. Yeah, like habilis, yeah. But really, yeah. maybe we had debates about that on the modern day debate or on other channels. Instead of, I would instead like of, to see more debates where it's just about you two people who are who something interesting, yeah. something interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. No, who wants? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess you know, creation evolution debates get views or flat Earth debates get views, but uh, who cares? Yeah. Well, anymore? it's like the in in the human evolution thing. Some of the things move on. So uh, a, a hot debate between out of Africa versus multi-regionalism has kind of become yeah. irrelevant because yeah. both were right <laughs> that, it, that there is in fact gene flow going on in these various groups and the ones with the Denisovans and all that have only reinforced it. At the same time, you still have multiple pulses out of Africa. So the, the, the difficulty before was camps that was like, it's either this one or it's that one. No, it can be both, you doofuses. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, Brian, that's, um, that is a, a point. Like, um, I think it'd be interesting to see two people debate, um, the, you know, is it the, which is correct, the short fuse or the long fuse Cambrian explosion, mm, or yeah. what's the utility of the species concept or something like that. Something that, that is actually interesting to me rather than, is the earth young? Is the earth flat? 
No. Or, or do done. we need a new evolutionary synthesis? That's one of the cutting That's edge another, things where, yeah, where you've got yeah. Gary Coyne there's, saying, yeah, it's all a subset of the, the modern view versus now there's so many new things in here that it's kind of a new perspective. And that's another one where probably both are right and both are wrong. But it all yeah. depends on how you want to look at it. It yeah, is, I, I, however, you, those debates would be useful because a lot of that stuff that would be popping up in any one of those topics are ones that will filter into anti-evolution apologetics at the authority quote level. You know. Yeah. But I think like, I've been back there during the when they're having debates between uh, is tectonic plates a thing, plate tectonic a thing, or was yeah. oh. the asteroid or was the asteroid a thing that killed the dinosaurs? Like, oh yeah, the, the, there are creationists. We noted it in in the book. Uh, yeah. that there are a branch of creationists who are still digging in their heels and rejecting that, but Andrew Snelling functionally has accepted the, the Chichalube impact. He just thinks it took place really, really recently. Hey, can we um, just put that into context that there are creationists out there who still think that there's dinosaurs in the Congo, too? So just to, just Oh, yeah, to your it. Kent Hovind well, style. They're still running off with that. Well, Benga Bailey or whatever the hell it's well, called. And, well, technically, and, they're right. They're, they're yeah, they are. So. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I eat dinosaur, you know, at least once a week. There you, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. I just said before, traces are right. They were, if the if it was real, they were dinosaurs on the ark. Because Noah sent <laughs> the, the raven out to get, get some, like, checker stuff. First thing on the ark. Yeah. <laughs> one, of the, one of the most hilarious attempts to kind of disconnect, we'll be alluding to this in, in the new Rocks book about how. Um, there's an obvious connection between the Mesopotamian flood stories and the Genesis flood story. And some of the ones tried to defuse that by saying they're totally different. For example, the Bible says they set out a raven last, whereas this one Bible, a, a Babylonian tale says they set out a crow first. I mean, they're not at all alike. No, they're, they're not both like Corvids or anything, not both in the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, well, most people, if they, if they, Know the run the risk of running my camera here. Confusion. Some people might. Some people like think think. If I if you know any better, they think the raven and the crow were the same thing almost. <laughs> well, I think they would be classified in the same kind. I, I haven't looked at Leitner's uh, analysis. She basically uh, accepts each family as a kind of bird. You what? The, Do the, we need to talk weirdest... about uh, speciations like uh, yeah, among, uh, Coleoptera? I said, I said, about, I said, like, yeah. Uh, actually, you're talking about that uh, topic I want to talk about in the future, spe speciation. Uh, something, yeah. For a future video. Uh, yeah, yeah, allopatric cool, cool versus sympatric and how the whole concepts kind of go, eh, and we deal with bacteria. Yeah. Like, I talk about how, like, like the pre, the pre, some of the prezygotic things as language barriers. And was, yeah, and how prezygotic how isolation mechanisms. There's a little phrase for everybody. Hey, and kids, like, Google that. And like, like how f far to like, like even humans language barriers can be, how that how, we haven't been far enough. But no, like oh yeah, like language is an absolutely there. brilliant um, uh, progenitor. Oh, that's actually would be another one for a genuine science uh, discussion. Is the issues about yeah, we know the Indo-European language. What's the circumstance of how language developed in the human species and differentiation way before? the branching off into the forms we had and how far back does it go in the hominids? I was gonna say way before we were a human species would be my with my yeah, yeah I, I would agree. I, I cannot I think, imagine that the early tool makers that, that wasn't part and parcel of the development of the language system, that prospect of how they were teaching there's elements about how you teach how to make those tools. You can't just do it by demonstration. You've got to talk about the stone. It, it, and also, uh, again, we'll talk about it in the future, but like how f how far apart the speciation happened on any animals, like 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 with the humans and Neanderthals, we used to be one species when we speciated yeah. enough enough to inter enough to interbreed still, but still we were separate species. But yet, yeah. the Native Americans were isolated, and Australians were isolated there, there, but we're still the same species. The yeah. So the, uh, well, okay, but the time period was shorter. Yeah, so yeah, shorter yeah that's true. Like that ten thousand years what, or so. That's what I was gonna. gonna, gonna uh, well, I mean, well, Australia, in, it's forty-five thousand years they've been isolated yeah. there, so that's not a short time. But that, compare that to the isolation seven hundred thousand years. Yeah, yeah. You know, between the, glaciations coming in. True. So they the 
the Neanderthal, the Erectus uh, yeah. ancestors that went and formed the Denisovans and the uh, and the Neanderthals, yeah. and then glaciers came in and kind of yeah. separated them and isolated yeah. them. And, and there, the, yeah, we, we must never forget the Homo erectus clade. That bunch is an amazingly staggering so success story. They went all over the place, and they they had a huge long run, and so it's just an astonishing thing that it's it's probably the most gigantic leap in the history of humans to where they went from relatively isolated populations to a multi-continental one, and yes, had a thing ran over a million years. Yeah, like, like even the Neanderthals and stuff, they 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 still had they still weren't far enough that we could still have get on with them. Yeah. yeah, of which you only needed about like a hundred blinkings or so, and that could account for all the introgression that you have. It's it's a real, over a, such a long period of time, not a lot. It's supposed to be think about the, you know, how how ring species work. I, I heard I know if we we could breed. I, I'm not sure. Actually, we probably get more of this in Erica's talk next week. But if we could like breed with them like, right out of Africa and we, in the Arabian, by the time we got up to Europe, we're, we're still did we differ enough that we could like a ring species more, kind of situation. Yeah. Or we, or can mm -hmm. we still get on with the European Neanderthals? Or was it too far apart by that point? Somebody well, needs to have that little cue with with them. Them. Yeah, 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 kind of background music for a lot of that discussion. <laughs> I so say you could always get along with them. It's whether or not you can produce babies. You can you can get it on yeah. with them. You know, any and the unknown people. area is is which direction was it going? Because a, a pre uh, um, isolation in say bird flies can reach the point where the males of one clade will, a group won't interbreed with the other, but the females of the thing will go. So we'll go one direction but not the other. And so it's not a thing where the thing shuts off all in one fell swoop. It's a process and it varies from one species to another and one dynamic to another. So, uh, mm -hmm. and we've really, uh, hybridization, we've really been able to dig into that a lot. Uh, like uh, with uh, circus experiments, is mostly what it was with the big cats and the different pantherines. We know, you know, different combinations and what they produce. We know that, and it kind of branches outside of pantherine no. a little bit too, because you get, uh, you get, uh, the uh, cougars, which are outside of the traditionally a class outside of pantherine, so uh, and they can breed with leopards. Uh, as far as as far as we know, they, they haven't bred with any other uh, species of pantherine, but they can breed leopards. But their offspring are always dwarfed. Yeah, that was really good. It reminds me. Everyone talks about how lions uh, and tigers can get together and breed those two the laggers and the tie-ons, mm -hmm. but there's like, you look at the chart, there's a lot more closer species, a lot more closer related tips than tigers and lions are pretty far apart, technically. And well, a lot of it, they, they, you, you can't rule out the issues of pheromones, you can't rule out M MHC molecules, there's a whole slew of variables. That, that just as in our own species, the very enormous complexity of what turns you on and so forth and so on. Um, and it's it, it, it's no less complicated with other species. So the notion, any idea of a simplistic one size fits all mode, yeah, it won't work. Nature's too, too varied for that. Yeah, and if you think about the speciation, how, how fungi speciated. Right, back to fungi. So how about we have a talk in the future on speciation? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Th Start getting that. Start getting that slides already, Jackson. Whoa, yeah, the yeah. assumptions. And, 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 and it, because there's so much of the, of the history of it, and the, the the impact that Darwin had, and then the impact that Ernst Mayer had, and uh, all of that, and as well as the muddle that common people have about the notion and the confusion with kinds and the creationist aspect. Yeah, that's worthy of a show. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, Y'all want to say your ending catchphrases? Um, Don't accept do any an wooden penguins. <laughs> Be kind and take care. Um, uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Right. I guess I do have a catchphrase. <laughs> All right, never stop, never stop learning, and enjoy the randomness. We'll see y'all then. Bye.